Well, hello, family and friends. Well, as I mentioned yesterday, I am sharing with you one of my family's traditions. One in one of our family's traditions is every year, the week leading up to Easter during homeschool is how it started out. We read this book. The First Easter by Peter Marshall. And I, I don't really share that with a whole lot of people, some of our traditions, because they're just really precious to our family and everything. But if you're like me, one, you've, you come, as you get older, you come to the realization how important traditions are. And two, you start thinking, what are my own family's traditions? Like, what can we do that makes us different, that makes us special? And then three, I've learned the art of storytelling. I mean, it's totally different. Can, you, you can read words. Have you ever just read a book or something that, like, the words just come alive on the page? And especially if it's something that's maybe um, telling about a story in the Bible or something. If you're like me, I read the words on the Bible as just flat words for years and years and years. I just really couldn't see them as human beings. In my mind, they were like superhumans. But Peter and Paul, and James and all these different people, they were human beings like you and I. They had struggles just like you and I did. They had to go through some tough stuff and they didn't have these like superhuman strength, superhuman powers. What they did do, what they did have, especially people after Jesus died and Holy Spirit came to and filled them, is we have Holy Spirit living inside of us that does give us power, that empowers us. But it's important that we see the Bible through the lens of these are humans that did extra extraordinary things by and through the grace of God. So if you're not, find yourself a comfortable place. You're not going to need your Bible today. I'm just reading over the next few days. This is day two. I'm going through and reading through this book. It'll take us about 20 minutes a day. It's a really short book. It's like 120 pages. This guy was a pastor. I think he originally came from Scotland, but um, it's an amazing, amazing book. You can go back to video one. So grab you some coffee, find you somewhere close, are comfortable to sit and just enjoy. This is what I do with my family every year at Easter and it really helps bring the gospel, the story of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. It really just makes things more tangible, easier to swallow because you can actually visualize it um, and it just brings the story alive. So with that said, I'm gonna drink myself some coffee, you get yourself some coffee and we'll read on day two, okay? Here we go. By the way, I didn't mention this yesterday. If this is something that you're interested in doing, this book is not broken down into chapters. If you leave me a copy, I can I can tell you what I do is I have this book broken down by five days, four days, or three days, depending on how you're reading it. We are reading it currently in a three-day three reading pro program just because on day four then, which is Thursday, I preach a sermon called It's Time to Resurrect Your Hope, which, by the way, I will be releasing that sermon on Friday probably around lunchtime, okay? On Good Friday. All right, are y'all ready? Let's do this. Here we go. The Last Supper was over, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the dark and deserted streets. It was almost midnight. Past the lower pool and through the fountain gate, they walked slowly, moving in little silent clusters. For a time, the narrow cobblestone street baked high in the middle, led beside the brook Cedron. The group moved up the hill toward their favorite rendezvous, a garden called Gethsemane. Here in the deep shadows of the night, moving along in the deeper shadows of trees, they halted. A few lights twinkled on the hill opposite, but most of the city was asleep, for it was now after midnight. They could see the temple, its spire tipped with gold glistening in the moonlight. And from the ramparts and of the forest Antonia, they could hear a Roman sentry calling his watch. As they stood there looking across the valley at the holy city, they wondered at the strange turn events had taken. They remembered the re-echoing shouts of the people, the glad Hoseas, and the crown that had been refused. Some of them were thinking of how Judas had left their fellowship to move out into the darkness. They were wondering where he was and what he was doing. The eleven could not know that the betrayer had already agreed to Caiaphas' offer of 30 pieces of silver, the cost of a slave it was, or that Caiaphas was, even, was then, even, uh, then moving under the cover of the velvet night to seek audience with the Roman procurator. If the Nazarene is captured this night, will you agree to sit in the tribunal to condemn him on the morrow? 
The group moved into the garden under the gnarled old trees. The odor of the olive presses clung to the still night air, and now there was a period of waiting, as though the master deliberately waited for some rendezvous with destiny. His apostles knew not what. Once again, he could easily have escaped, yet he did not. There was plenty of time, so much time, that the weary apostles propped against the olive trees fell asleep. While they slept, Christ prayed, kneeling under the little gray-green leaves that gleamed white where the moonlight filtered through. Was there no other way? No other way? Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. This cup. Often Christ had seen the bodies of the crucified hanging on the hill outside the Ganath gate. Sometimes he had heard their moans and their curses, seen them writhing in their final agony. Jesus of Nazareth was a man, a real man. Every bit of his manhood shrank from such an end. Luke tells us, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Already, he was living the pain of it. Could ultimate triumph come in no other way? Human sin, man fleeing God, was capable of dreadful deeds. Of course, but must he be the one to taste every depth that sin could devise? Misunderstanding, betrayal, desertion by friends, expediency, weakness, callousness, deliberate cruelty, excruciating pain, and death itself. Could he experience these things all to prove finally and forever that evil is no match for the father? The worn face glistening with sweat, so young in time, grown so old in understanding, bowed in final surrender. Nevertheless, father, not as I will, but you. The stillness of the garden was suddenly broken by the low sound of voices, and now a flickering torch came into view. And another, and another. Surely this was a procession. There were soldiers, twigs crackled under their feet, and they stooped low as they passed under the olive trees. Someone in front carried a swinging lantern. A nondescript mob it was, a rabble of indiscriminate, indiscriminate ruffians, the hangers-on from the temple, soldiers, temple guards, little priests with big ambitions who had laid aside their rings of heavy keys, exchanged their, exchanged their brooms for staves and spears for bludgeon, bludgeons, armed to the teeth, determined to capture the most peaceable one who ever walked upon the earth. Out of that sickening crowd, there stepped a familiar figure. It was Judas, a smile upon his face. Hail, master, he said, and he kissed him with a kiss, kiss that must have burned Christ's cheek. Thus identified, Christ was seized, bound with ropes, his hands manacled, his arms tied to his side. The disciples, too, were caught in the trap. After a moment's hesitation, some of them seemed to gain courage to think of fighting in defense of their master. One asked, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? And Peter, not waiting for the answer, drew from the folds of his cloak a short dagger, more like a sword, and they recklessly struck a vicious blow at the nearest enemy. It happened to be the high priest's servant, the one whose name was Malchus, and the blow severed his right ear. But when Christ saw what Peter had done, he quickly commanded him to put up the sword. He said, they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. See, the method of Peter was the sword, but the method of Christ was the cross. Peter sought revenge and Christ, Christ, he sought reconciliation. Peter cried, give me a sword and we can advance the kingdom. And Christ cried, give me a cross and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And so they led him away as a butcher might drag a steer to the slaughterhouse. Simon Peter had seen the last flickering torch disappear round the turn of the path that wound down the hill. Only once in a while could the lights of the procession be seen through the trees like giant fireflies. The murmur of voices died away, the crackling of twigs and the rustling of dislodged stones through the grass. There swept over Peter the realization that his master had at last been captured and was marching away to die. 
The icy fear that gripped his heart was a startling contra contrast to the flaming courage with which he had drawn his short sword just a few moments before, for this was a different Peter. He realized that he had blundered and that he had been rebuked. Disappointed and puzzled, he could not understand the calm submission with which Christ had permitted them to bind his hands and march him off. Realizing that he stood alone in the deserted garden, Peter stumbled blindly down the trail, heedless of the twigs that lashed his face and tore at his robes. Stumbling on down the hill, instinctively hurrying to catch up with the others, and yet not anxious to get too close, he followed down to the foot of the Mount of Olives, across from the book Brook Cedron, and back up the hill to Old Jerusalem, still asleep and quiet. The procession made first for the house of Annas, into which they escorted Jesus. The heavy door creaked shut behind him, and when Peter approached timidly, it was to find John standing there. John persuaded the girl stationed at the door to let them in, and as they slipped past her, she scrutinized Peter and said to him, Are you not one of this man's disciples? And he said, I am not. Perhaps she felt that she could speak to Peter. Perhaps she felt sorry for him, seeing the hurt, wounded look in his eyes and the pain in his face. Who knows what was in her mind? Perhaps she had seen the master as they led him in and felt the irresistible attraction to the great Galilean. Perhaps in that brief moment, as they crowded past her, he, Jesus, had looked at her. If he had, then something had happened to her within her own heart. Her faith might have been born, a fire kindled by the spark that winds of the winds of strange circumstances had blown from the altar fires in the heart of the Son of God. Perhaps she wanted to ask Peter more about the Master. Perhaps she would have said, had Peter acknowledged him, tell me, tell me, what is the sound of his voice? Is it low and sweet? Is it vibrant? Tell me some of his miracles. Tell me how you are so sure. How are you so sure that he is the Messiah? What is this salvation he speaks about and how can we live on forever? Maybe these questions would have come tumbling in a torrent from her lips. Who knows? But whatever she meant, whatever her motive was for asking the question, are you not one of this man's disciples? Peter denied his Lord and said, I am not. We can always stand aghast at Peter and wonder if the strain and the shock have destroyed his memory. Simon, Surely you remember the first day you saw him, Andrew and yourself, floating across the folded net, his shadow falling across you as you worked. Peter, do you not remember his command, his beckoning finger, the light in his eyes as he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Peter, don't you remember? In that night when Nicodemus came into the garden looking for the master, do you not remember how he crept up in his, with his cloak pulled up over his face? Don't you remember how frightened you and the Lord and Nicodemus, how he frightened you and how the Lord and Nicodemus talked for hours about the promises? Don't you remember the wedding at Cana where he turned water into wine? Don't you remember the music of his laugh and the Samaritan woman at Sychar? Don't you remember these things, Simon? And now they brought the Lord from Annas to Caiaphas, and the soldiers and the temple guards mingled with the servants in the courtyard. Because the night was cold, they had kindled a fire in the brazier, and Peter joined himself in the group and, stretching out his hands, warmed himself at the fire. Peter was glad to join the hangers-on huddled around the blaze, for the morning air bit sharply, and he found himself shivering. It was a kindly glow of warmth. Coarse laugh laughter greeted every joke, and they discussed the things that people talk about. The prowess of the garrison's chariot drivers, the gambling losses about of their friends, the new actor from Antioch at Herod's court, the additional water tax just levy, the latest gossip of Rome. Peter was not paying much attention to their conversation until one of the soldiers nudged him and said, You are also one of them. And Peter, for the second time, said, Man, I am not. Peter. Oh, Peter, you must remember, surely it must be that you are afraid. Your brave heart must have turned to water. 
Surely you could not have forgotten many a time crossing the lake in boats like your own, with its high seats, its patched sails slanting in the sun and his thick oars. Do you remember, Peter, the night he came walking on the water and you tried it and were walking like the master until your courage left you and your faith gave way? Simon, has your courage left you again? Have you forgotten the pool at Bethesda and how you laughed when the impotent man rose, rolled up his bed, threw it over his shoulder, and went away leaping in the air and shouting? Ah, oh, Peter, you spoke so bravely. And now, here you are. For the next hour or so, they merely waited. What was keeping them so long? They little knew the difficulty of getting witnesses to agree. They little knew that sleepless men with tempers raw and irritated were trying to find some reason they could to submit to Pilate that would justify their demands for the death of Jesus. After an hour had passed, there joined a soldier who had come out of the palace. As he greeted his friends in the circle, his eye fell on Peter. He scrutinized him very carefully, and Peter, feeling the examination of the newcomer, looked around as the soldier asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? One of his friends joined in, Certainly, he's one of the Gal Galileans. Listen to his accent. And the soldier stubbornly went on. He said, I'm sure I saw him in the garden, for my kinsman Malchus was wo wounded by one of them who drew a sword. And if I'm not mistaken, it's this fellow here. Then Peter, beginning to curse and to swear, he said, I do not know the man. Peter used language he had not used for years. It was vile. Even the soldiers were shocked. They all looked at him in amazement. They did not appear to notice the shuffling of feet as soldiers led Christ from Caiaphas to Pilate. Perhaps they didn't make much noise. They were tired, worn with argument and talk, so they were very quiet. The group standing around the fire was silent, shocked, at the vehemence and the profanity of Peter's denial. It was a torrent of foulness, but it was his face that startled them. It was livid, distorted, eyes blaring, mouth snar snarling like a cornered animal. It was not a pleasant sight, and they kept silent. It was a silence so intense that the crowing of a distant cock was like a bugle call. Immediately, Peter remembered the Lord's prophecy. Before the cock crows three times, you before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Like a wave there swept over him the realization of what he had done. With tears streaming down his face, he turned away from the fire. Ahead of them he saw the stairway that led to Pilate's palace, and by a terrible providence, it was just at that moment that Christ was being led up the stairs to appear before Pilate. The Lord had heard him. The Lord had heard every hot, searing word. The Lord had heard the blistering denial, the foul fisherman's oath. Jesus, his precious Jesus, had heard it all. Christ paused on the stair and looked down over the rail. He looked right into the very soul of Peter. The eyes of the two met at that very awful moment. Through his tears, all else was a blur to Peter. Oh, Peter. But that one face, that one face shone through the tears. That lovely face, that terrible face, those eyes, sad, reproachful, tender, as if they understood and as if they under uh, forgave. Ah, oh, how well Peter knew him and how much Peter loved him. The world seemed to stand still as, for that terrible moment, people, Peter looked at the one he had denied. We shall never know what passed between them. Christ seemed to say again, but I've prayed for you, Simon. Satan has denied, desired to, to have you, but I have prayed for you. Simon's tears now overflowed and ran down his cheeks. Hot and scalding tears they were. And with great sobs shaking his strong frame, he spun round and rushed out to where the cool of the mor uh, morning air might fan his burning cheeks. He fled with his heart pounding in his chest while the Nazarene walked steadily, uh, walked steadily to meet the Roman governor. <laughs> Then they assembled together, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people, to the palace of the high priest, 
who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that he might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Why did the religionists of Jesus' time want to kill him? Why was Caiaphas in particular anxious to get him out of the way? What was the charge against this Nazarene? The Sadducees were the religious elite of the day. Not only was Caiaphas, the present high priest, a Sadducee, but he was also the son-in-law of Annas, now an old man whom, who had, whom he had succeeded in that office. Now that Palestine was under Roman jurisdiction, even the high priest was a Roman appointee. But so crafty a politician was Annas that Caiaphas was the seventh member of his own family to receive the coveted appointment. Both were wealthy, wealthy men. The temple, the religious domain over which they presided, was also a financial empire. By a rare financial strategy, they had made it so. Annas and Caiaphas controlled the market in the temple porch where sacrifices were sold to pilgrim worshippers and Roman money was exchanged for the statutory half-shekel required as a temple offering. The priests demanded the rate of exchange and made money shamelessly. Moreover, they drew rent from the ground on which the sellers of animals for sacrifice put their stalls and stacked their dove cages. The people knew this and resented it. But what could they do? What can the general populace ever do about taxes that eat up the fat of the land? An income equivalent to millions of dollars a year was flowing into the temple treasuries. Jesus knew all of this. It was common knowledge. No wonder his indignation was aroused, especially when this evil was carried on in the name of worship of this living God. The most scathing words ever uttered were spoken against the men who perpetrated this wholesale theft. The scathing words had come to the ears of Annas and Caiaphas. For many months they had, been, had had spies reporting back to them on the itinerant preacher. Exactly how dangerous is he? The day came when the Nazarene strode into the temple court and overthrew the tables of the money changers. That dynamic figure had stridden about among the merchants, unafraid. The folds of his robe falling away from his right arm had revealed powerful muscles. Angry priests had stood helplessly by, muttering threats in throaty growls. The money changers had screamed in frenzy as they had groveled among the filth to receive retrieve their coins that had rolled in a hundred directions, and the pilgrims, who had been bled all these years, had laughed, laughed and added their own shouts of encouragement. Minutes later, an observer had run to tell the servant of the high priest, but Caiaphas was afraid of the common people, and he dared not intervene. For the popularity of this Jesus was so largely with the con uncommon, I'm sorry, for this popularity of this Jesus was largely with the common folk. Stories of his wonderful works were everywhere. The beggars in the streets talked of them. They were discussed by the drivers of the caravans at every stop, and the stories lost nothing in the telling. It was said that he had healed the blind. There were cripples who had thrown away their crutches. There was a current story about a little girl who had been dead and had been restored to her father. And now, now, the latest story, the one about Lazarus, a prominent citizen, indeed a wealthy man of Bethany, he had been brought back to life. Caiaphas had secretly checked and rechecked. The task had not been too difficult because Bethany was so close. He had been unable to find anyone to refute the story. It was so odd, enough to make a man uneasy. With such power and growing following, anything, anything could happen. No wonder the chief priests and the Pharisees got together and asked, What shall we do? For this man does many miracles. If we leave him alone, all men will believe on him, and the, Roman sh the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Caiaphas was the one who suggested a solution. Only the Romans could execute a death sentence. Surely it was, less, uh, surely it was useless to settle for less. Nothing else would finally silence the Galilean. Therefore, the crux of the problem was to find a charge against Jesus that would satisfy Roman law. The high priest well knew that if the true Messiah should ever come, there would be two immediate results. The political supremacy of Rome would be challenged by revolt. This would mean that Rome's suppression of the revolt by violence and the Messiah, if accepted by the people, would usurp Caiaphas' own position and power. Did not this Jesus claim to be the Messiah? Then this was the perfect charge. So Caiaphas argued to the priest, It is expedient for you that one man should die, not uh, for the people, and that the whole nation should not perish, 
From that day forward, they took counsel that they might put him to death. And now, with Judas's help, it had come. The Nazarene, his hands bound with ropes, his face and beard matted with blood from the blows of the soldiers, stood before them. The court had been hastily convened in the middle of the night. Some of Caiaphas's colleagues might have been drowsy and half asleep at that time, but the high priest was thoroughly alert. For hours, he had been busy getting word to the 70 members of the Sanhedrin, trying to round up men who would testify against Christ. Haste was important. The members of the Sanhedrin sat on sewn stone seats in the three-tiered semicircle. Some seats were vacant. It was still an hour before dawn. Witness after witness came forward. But the witnesses could not agree among themselves, and the prisoner refused to say anything. As soon as one spoke against Jesus, another contradicted, and a great tumult broke out. Caiaphas grew red in the face with mounting frustration. He had already risked much to bring Jesus to trial. You see... It was illegal, illegal for the temple guard acting under the orders of the high priest to arrest a prisoner. The arrest should be, have been made spontaneously by the witnesses. It was clearly against the law to try a capital charge at night. Finally, Caiaphas, having utterly failed with his witnesses, knew not that nothing that had ever been said could be give the color of justice to the sentence of death. He rose from his seat and walked over to where he could look down into the calm face of the prisoner. If witnesses could not condemn him, he must try to get him to condemn himself. Turning to the Nazarene, the judge addressed Jesus. Will you not give a response to the things these witnesses say against you? But Jesus, Jesus held his peace. The silence angered the high priest. He seemed ready to explode. The jewels on his robe sparkled and flashed in the light from the bronze lamps, and his eyes flashed anger. And then, with all the authority he could crowd into the words, Caiaphas put Jesus to the solemn Jewish oath of testimony. He said, I adjure you, I adjure you by the living God. When a question was put like that to a loyal Jew, it was an offense not to answer. Caiaphas was asking a question that really mattered, a question that required an answer, clear-cut, like chiseled marble. And the question rang out through the assembly, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you, you are not the Son of God. The priests and rabbis, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, all learned men of Israel, they all knew they all understood what the question meant. They sprang to their feet in excitement, craning forward to catch the reply. Would the Nazarene reply? If he kept his silence, then the Sanhedrin would have no choice but to release him. His life hung on his answer. Once again, Jesus took the initiative on his road to the cross. He would answer. His voice rang out. There are three versions of his reply in the Gospels. Mark writes it, I am. Matthew writes it, you have said. And Luke writes it, you say that I am. The meaning is the same. There was no doubt in the mind of the high priest as to what Jesus' reply signified. At last, he had triumphed. He swung round on the assembled rabbis, tearing his robe from top to bottom, according to the custom. His voice shrill with victory, he shouted, What further need we have we of witnesses? The charge of blasphemy had been established. It was significant. The Sanhedrin had no choice but to impose this solemn sentence. He is liable to be put to death. And that's where we stop for today. I hope that you're enjoying this reading of the first Easter. Again, this is day two out of day five. I'll read up through Friday about 20 minutes a day. This is a really excellent book if you're looking for a way to incorporate Easter into your family and Easter bunnies and Easter eggs just aren't enough. You really want to incorporate the story of Christ. I encourage you to get this book and to read it. Many blessings and favor be upon you. See you tomorrow at this time. Bye.